Let's jump right in. A small charge feels an electric force in the presence of an external electric field. That force is the charge in coulombs, say 3 coulombs, we'll just use totally unrealistic values to keep things simple, times the electric field in newtons per coulomb, say 2 newtons per coulomb in magnitude, so 6 newtons towards the right in this case. Remember, if Q is negative, our definition here, QE, takes care of that by flipping the sign of the force vector automatically so it points in the opposite direction. We also know a magnetic force will act on the charge if the charge is moving with some velocity V and there's an external magnetic field present B. Remember how we find the magnetic force? Right hand rule, V cross B gets us the direction for F. In this case, if there were no other forces acting on the charge, it would just move in a circle at constant speed. Or in fancier terms, it would undergo centripetal motion. So up until now, we've dealt with the electric field on its own and the magnetic field on its own. But what if we had both at the same time? Is it even possible to have both? Well, sure it is. Having a uniform electric field and a uniform magnetic field act in the same region at the same time is a pretty easy thing to accomplish in practice. I mean, why shouldn't we be allowed to have both? So with that established, let's come back to it later. Imagine now we had a beam of charged particles. They could be charged alpha particles or electrons, whatever they may be. In a lab setting, there are many applications where we have tiny charged particles moving in a beam, but we're not sure if they're all traveling at the same speed. In general, it's almost certainly the case that they're traveling at very different speeds unless we do something about it. So is there any way that we could ensure that they're all traveling at the same speed? Well, forcing them all to exactly the same speed would require a lot of effort and a lot of thinking on our part. Because we'd have to take this one here and bump it up a bit, and we have to take this one here and nudge it down a bit. How would we know what to do to which charges? Moreover, how exactly would we nudge each individual charge? We can't just stick our hand into the beam and move each charge like we're showing here. Each particle would be too small to adjust manually. Rather, we can do something really clever involving what we put aside earlier. Imagine we have an electric field acting perpendicular to a beam of charged particles. We can create a uniform electric field really easily with just a parallel plate capacitor. We'll assume for now that the charges are all positive. We'll talk about the negative case later. Now, what happens to the charges when they enter the electric field? Some of the charges will go a long distance before hitting the negative plate because they have high speeds, whereas the other slow pokes can't keep up and hit the plate at a much earlier distance. Anyway, this isn't exactly helping in any practical way. It might help us figure out how many charges are going at a certain speed, but it doesn't help us do anything with those charges. As soon as they hit the plate, they're gone. And that's where the magnetic field comes in. The key to understanding the velocity selector is that the electric force is the same electric force on all the charges, no matter what speed they're going at. The electric force is the same as long as each charge is the same, which they all are if we're using a beam of uniformly charged particles. However, if we had a magnetic force acting in roughly the opposite direction, the magnitude of the force would depend on the speed of the charge. A faster speed would generate a stronger magnetic force, while a slower speed would generate a weaker magnetic force, even though the electric force stays the same, since the electric force doesn't depend on the velocity. So given a positive charge with velocity towards the right, what direction does a magnetic field have to point for the magnetic force on the positively charged particles to be upwards? Take a second to think about that, it's kind of like an inverse question. Instead of what's the direction of the force based on the velocity and magnetic field, it's what's the direction of the magnetic field based on the velocity and magnetic force. If we use the right hand rule, we start by pointing our right fingers in the direction of the velocity, and we want our thumb to point upwards in the direction of the magnetic force. So curling our right fingers would have them point into the screen here. So that means our magnetic field points into the screen. Technically, it could point in any of these other weird directions that we curl our fingers in, but we'll ignore that complication and just keep things simple with right angles everywhere. The magnetic field points straight into the screen. That's how we can get V cross B to give us an upward direction for the magnetic force. So given specific electric and magnetic fields, only charged particles with a very specific velocity are going to make it to the opening at the end. Charges that are too slow won't have a magnetic force that's strong enough to overcome the electric force, so they get deflected downwards. 
Charges that are too fast have the opposite problem. The magnetic force is so strong that it's overpowering the electric force, so the charges get deflected upwards. Only charges that are going at a speed that's just right, like in the Goldilocks story, will make it to the end. Now that we have the intuition down, what is that speed? How do we quantify the speed or velocity that's just right? The simplest thing to do here would be to create a free body diagram. We have the electric force going downwards, and we expect it to completely balance the magnetic force going upwards for the particles that are just right. The reason they have to balance is because if they didn't, we'd have acceleration downwards or acceleration upwards. Our condition is that the charge doesn't accelerate, it just moves with constant speed to the finish line. We can also just ignore gravity here. The gravitational force would be so small for such tiny particles that it wouldn't make a difference if we include it or not. So we can start by saying the magnetic force is equal and opposite to the electric force. But it'll actually be more convenient to set their magnitudes equal to each other if all we care about is the speed. Plus, we already know the directions of everything, so a vector equation will just give us redundant information. For the magnetic force, we have a magnitude of QV cross B, and for the electric force, we have a magnitude of QE. Conveniently, we can pull out the absolute value of the charge on both sides, which cancels. And the magnitude of V cross B is just VB sine theta. No more vectors here, all scalars. Here, since we conveniently chose the velocity and magnetic fields to be at right angles, theta is 90 degrees and sine theta is 1, leaving us with just the speed times the magnetic field strength on the left. Now all we have to do is divide by b, so v equals e over b. The speed for which the two forces balance out is equal to the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength. It's remarkable how the speed doesn't depend on the charge of the particles at all. We were able to just divide out the charge and remove it from the analysis altogether. So it doesn't matter how small or how large the charge is, at least until we need to worry about interactions between the charges. The velocity we select only depends on the electric and magnetic field strengths. You might ask, well, what if the charge is negative? Surely that screws all this up, right? Well, actually, if the charge is negative, the electric force is now heading upwards, opposite the direction of the electric field. But the magnetic force flips direction too. Here, if we use the right hand rule, so pointing our right fingers in the velocity direction and curling them in the direction of the B field, which is into the screen, the magnetic force on a positive charge would be the direction our thumb points. So the magnetic force on negative charge experiences would be opposite that. And all the math still checks out. Our equation is still valid even for negative charges. The best part is that in a lab setting, the electric field strength and magnetic field strength are usually in our control. They might just be dials on a machine that we could tune, so we could select out charged particles traveling at any velocity we want just by tuning E and B. In practice, you don't even need dials like that. You could just have a single dial which tunes for a specific velocity and the machine just takes care of the rest. In the next lesson, we'll build on top of this velocity selector device and talk about the mass spectrometer. See you there.